Right. Well, Mikhail's at the beach or somewhere. Mm, it's a beautiful sunset. Okay. Oh, nice. Okay. So do I have to, I, do I just read the preamble without the stuff about public hearings? Is that? Yeah, the whole remote meeting thing. Okay. Yep. Okay. So it is 633 and we are here uh, for the Amherst Historical Commission meeting on November 13th. Um, meeting by Zoom, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020, order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law C30A, Section 18, and pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and extended by Chapter 2022 of the Acts of 2022, and extended again by the state legislature on July 14th, 2022, and signed into law on July 16th, 2022, this public meeting of the Town of Amherst Historical Commission is being conducted by a remote particip participation. Members of the public who wish to access this meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. A hyperlink to the hearing has been posted on the town's online calendar. Okay. Let's screen back up here. So, I have to pull my, there's the agenda. Announcements. Do you have any announcements, Nate? Uh, no announcements. I think we can cover stuff in the agenda topics that I okay. want to talk about. So. Okay. Um. Sorry, I've just got one screen and I know there's a fancy way to split it and I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, so um, the next item on the agenda after announcements is the review of the FY25 historic CPA proposals. We have the Mill River History Trail, the restoration of the North and South Cemeteries and the East Amherst Local Historic District Study Committee. Yeah, I think I'll just give an intro, or oh, Robin, you're there too on the CPA committee, but the CPA committee is meeting uh, weekly now to review proposals. They reviewed the three uh, that are on the agenda. Last week, there's a few more historic preservation proposals. Um, they'll review those in the next week or two. And then their, the hope is that they'd have recommendations by the end of the year, calendar year. Uh, so they're moving pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I think that's it. And you know, usually this the historical commission would write, you know, could write our um, recommendations or have Robin speak on our behalf at a CPA committee meeting. And I do, I do think that's probably important. You know, I it's I find that you know that they meet every week is it's a pretty fast paced review, and so it doesn't give you know us much time. So if we wanted to wait till next month, it could be too late, depending on where they are in the process. But so are they you, not going to present to us, Nate? In the past, the people who had CPA applications made a presentation to the Historical Commission. That is not going to happen this year. Is that correct? Well, tonight we can talk about the three, and then we're hoping next month we would have uh, the remaining ones come before the commission. So okay. there is someone here for the uh, Mill River History Trail. M maybe there's someone here. I thought, I thought I'd seen someone. Um, and then, yeah, so, you know, we would. I mean, it's, they're probably going to be, um, and they can be short presentations, but you can have people come. Thank you. I feel like the way the CPA committee is working, they don't allow a lot of time. It used to be that it was a longer review process by the committee. So then, you know, the historical commission or the conservation commission or, you know, the recreation commission, whatever respective board or committee needed to review proposals had that time to do it. And I'm not sure that that's. It's, it seems like it's not as well integrated into the process right now. Yeah, um, I would say that uh, I think that applicants are encouraged in the application process to consult with respective committees. I'm trying to think of what other um, CPA uh, proposals are out there. I know there's one from the Amherst Historical Society for um, is it engineering studies. I can't remember. Um, 
And um, what else is out there that's not town related? Oh, there's a, a homeowner that's looking to relocate. The house. Um, a historic house. Um, and anything else? I don't have my notes up. I was, yeah, I was trying to um, find the list too. Yeah, I thought there was one more, but I'm, maybe not. Maybe that's it actually. The house move in the... <clears throat> in the um, historical society. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's five. That's, oh, and the, um, the church, the North Amherst Church. The North Amherst Church, right. I knew there were six, all right, yeah. Yep. yep. Um, so I see Kat Stryker is in the attendees. I think she's here and she's raising her hand. Yes. She's here from Mill River, right? Hi, Kat, yes. you can unmute yourself. We can make you a um, panelist. That might be easier to present. So you'll be asked to rejoin as a panelist. I'm, I'm just promoting you now. Hi. Greetings. <laughs> hello, hello. Thanks so for joining us. Yeah, yeah, it's nice to be here. Um, obviously, we were expecting uh, Meg Gage to do the presentation. So I'm going to stand in for her as best I can as a newcomer to the Mill River History Trail project. Um, I sat in on one of their meetings, um, but our interests were closely aligned. So uh, I was very happy to join the group. And I was there for the presentation of the archaeological research, uh, which was presented during that meeting. And I have a little bit of an overview. Um, but uh, as we said by email, it's probably better if there are any uh, more detailed questions after the proposal to direct those by email to Meg, because she has been in this from the very beginning and she'll be able to answer them. But I'm also happy to meet everybody here this evening. Thank you. Thanks for joining us and we're eager to hear more. So uh, the proposal was submitted and um, you've, you've seen the next phase of the history trail, yeah? and uh, the proposal to research 12 additional sites, um, most of which don't have any archeological remains, um, things like the, the, in the sawmill on Summer Street, uh, Lithuania, Little Lithuania on Summer Street, um, the blacksmith shop behind the North Amherst Library Extension. And uh, that's what the committee are seeking funds for. Okay. Um, Nate, can you, is there anything pertinent that we'd want to pull up from their application? Just yeah, to so get... I, was, I was just trying to, um, get the documents in order. So I have a question, Kat. You'll be using the same consultants that you've used for the previous sites to help identify the historical aspects? Uh, this is going to be a different level of research because the archeological site was surveyed by uh, proper archeologists with experience on, um, on such, such things. So they did very detailed reports. But for this next part is very much uh, going back to the historical records that exist and beginning to tease out the stories. So there might not be any physical remains for uh, certain certain of the sites. Let me take a quick look. We've got you know Cushman Common, the Puffers Pond ice business, for example. I mean, there there's nothing left of that. 
Um, but the next phase of research would involve um, a researcher and uh, a supervisor, you know, going to the existing records and building out that story about the Puffers Pond ice business so that it's in a, a, a lovely accessible form for people. Um, and then also having a website to back that up so people can dig through different levels of storytelling and research from original documents at whatever level they want to understand it at. So we have this wonderful archaeological survey, which is already up on the District 1 North Amherst website, and it has enough detail to satisfy um, anybody. Uh, about the Roberts Mills. I mean, you could geek out forever on what they've put together, which is fabulous. Um, but if somebody was just casually walking through the woods and uh, they said, oh, you know, that's interesting. I wonder what that wall was. Um, they might be able to find a story about uh, who owned it and when it was operational and maybe when the, when it burnt down or something on those lines. So the next phase is very much in bringing out the, the social history, um, exploring the other 12 sites, which uh, we highlighted in the report, um, teasing out things that will be of uh, interest to people walking along the history trail about those and um, yeah, that is, that's the next phase. I have another question, if I may. Will you have markers at each of these sites to refer people back to the website to get more information? Yes, absolutely. Um, that's probably a question that um, Meg and the other members of the committee can give more detail on, but I understand they're using QR codes uh, so people can use smartphones and just point them at a sign along the way, which is next to the post, and then they can uh, pull up as much or as little information as they want about that. Um, I think it would be wonderful uh, to also have slightly broader rather than just a QR code to perhaps have a small graphic along with that. Um, but that's yet to be decided. Obviously, the um, the Conservation Committee needs to get involved in the signage, what exactly it's going to look like. But certainly there will be posts next to the sites with QR codes that people can find easily when they're walking along the trail. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so just to clarify, I just, I've got the budget in front of me here now. Um, Nate, maybe, maybe you can help me weigh in on this. Um, one of the issues we always have is what can CPA fund and what can it not fund? <laughs> and um, I think the, the uh, time for the archivist, which is budgeted at $25,000, and then uh, a project manager editor is another $25,000. Those would be uh, fall under the category of um, uh, reports that help the town manage uh, its cultural resources. Um, there is, the ask is for, uh, I think around 42. So I think between those two items and you know the CPA will, committee will get into more detail about this, but um, between those two items, they should fall under what's eligible to be covered. I'm not as clear on whether web design um, and printing and outreach would be um, justifiable expenses under the CPA, but since the ask is uh, for 40, uh, 40 something, I don't have it right in front of me, and those first two items total $50,000, it seems like that would be um, perfectly eligible and appropriate expenses. Um, as far as signage for that, that's something that would be a next phase that we're not, that that's, I think that's the intention of the trail project, but um, right now uh, it's not before us. <laughs> right, so yeah, so I'm sharing the budget screen. I, I think Robin, your assessment's correct. Um, you know, one of the CPA committee's questions were if the web design and printing and outreach were eligible. And, mm. you know, I, I think it's questionable. It's just one of those things that um, <clears throat> I think you could say it, it could be. But um, because the project is seeking to do fundraising, I think, you know, we would just say that the budget really is for 
you know, time of the archivist and man project manager, and that's those are eligible on their own. Um, and then uh, another comment that I I had was just that um, it would be something for the um, historic commission to consider um, the potential for this area to generate a national register nomination down the line, which I think would be a great outcome as well. Um, so that's definitely falls within the responsibilities of the historical commission. And I, I think that if I remember from my coursework, this would be a considered a cultural landscape. It would sort of, it would cover the layers of time that the land has been used for different, uh, in different historical contexts. So um, I would love to see uh, us and the, and, the, and the Mill River Trail project keep that in mind as we move forward. Again, it's not something that we're considering right now, but it uh, would be a good piece um, in terms of preservation and documentation going forward to think about for the commission to, to undertake. Does anybody else have questions, Hedy or Michaela? Hedy, you're muted if you're... Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm just making a note about the cultural landscape nomination, which I think would be wonderful down the road. Yeah, I mean, I think what's important about that is, Kat, if you relay this to Meg, is that that makes it, you know, could, you know, if there's any question about what, if this was eligible for CPA funding, that would make it eligible, right? That it is doing research that, you know, uh, something become, you know, can become inventoried and documented. I don't know if they'll question it, but, you know, when this is being presented or was it already presented? This wasn't already presented to the CPA committee. You know, they'll, it's, a, it's a very brief presentation and then it's just, you know, a 10, 15 minute discussion with uh, the CPA committee members. And so, although they've already asked questions of the proposal, they can, you know, they could have other questions while they're discussing it as a committee. And so, you know, I think yeah, that's really piece that. something that I can bring up too as, as the representative, so keep that in mind. Right. And there is a, a hand raised in the audience if there's no other commission comments. Michaela, do you have any comments? No, I'm good. Robin, can you uh, see that? We can, would you want Jane? Yeah. Oh, yep. Um, so we can recognize Jane Wald for comment. All right. Hey, Jane, you can unmute yourself. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I can. Please yes. identify yourself to the committee, Jane. <laughs> uh, I'm Jane Wald. I'm a, a former member of the Historical Commission, but in this instance, I'm a member of the, the Mill River Project Committee. Um, I hadn't uh, expected to be able to attend this, this meeting, but um, uh, can do so unexpectedly. So uh, I just wanted to be here to support Kat. Um, to, and I think she's done a, a, a wonderful job job of giving an overview of this project um, and just wanted to make myself available to answer other questions. I think the one thing I would say um, about the remaining 12 sites is that they are a combination of um, kind of lost resources, but also existing buildings, existing buildings, neighborhoods, and um, sort of three um, three areas of th that are contextual um, that are identified in as historic features but um, need, just need more research. So one is the um, uh, is about indigenous people who use the land uh, and and river and resources. There are hints about that that we'd like to um, learn more about uh geology of the mill river and its relationship to lake hitchcock so there's a kind of a historical geological um sort of ecosystem piece to it and then um social political and economic uh significance of the mill river factory district which um in the event that there is 
uh, some kind of nomination as a cultural landscape, uh, those aspects would be um, critically important <laughs> in, that, uh, in that application. Great, thank you, Jane. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. So thank you, Kat, for joining us and uh, giving us that overview. And um, I'll be seeing you guys in the CPA committee. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is the rest restoration of North and South cemeteries. Sure, I'll, you know, I, I'll speak to this. I presented to the CPA committee last week. The town's asking for 150,000 to restore, uh, you know, about 250 headstones, 125 in each cemetery, North and South. And then also to remove the fence. Um, there's a chain link fence around three sides of the North Cemetery, two, two and a half, three sides to remove that and put in granite posts. And also there's some uh, barbed wire fencing and some other fencing on South Amherst Cemetery. Uh, remove that and put in uh, posts. And so it's been documented that the South Amherst Cemetery at one point had you know over 30 hitching posts as markers. And so it's you know kind of akin to that, getting getting it back to that aesthetic rather than a, you know, a more modern fence. <clears throat> uh, you know, I think the CPA committee had some questions about this fence work and then also the kind of the historic value of cemeteries. And so, um, you know, I think we explained it, Robin and myself, but, you know, I think that I, it's always, it always seems to be the case that historic preservation projects, I think they, you know, there's such a range of what can be a preservation project and it's, it's much different when it's a conservation project. It's like, oh, we're buying land for wildlife habitat or we're getting a conservation restriction to protect a vernal pool or, you know, it just seems a little more straightforward. And so when you're talking about studying something or inventorying or restoring headstones, I know there's questions about, you know, why couldn't the families do this? And it's like, well, some of these families are, you know, <laughs> Long next, gone. Of, next of kin, <laughs> or it's just not even worth that effort to try to find someone from 250 years ago. Um, you know, and they were actually like, a they're a part of the, both of them are part of the common. They're part of the original layout of Amherst. And so I think that was made that these are really, you know, these are um, they've had a history and that the inventory form explained kind of the cultural significance. So, you know, I, I think that the CPA committee, um, you know, they seem pretty responsive to it. I will say that they have a fair number of asks and probably more funding than is available. And so they always ask, you know, could the project move forward with a smaller budget? Uh, and so, you know, I think they're probably going to ask that of every, every applicant, but so is our um, would I would guess that the um, that there would be two aspects to reduce funding. One would be to postpone the fence because that's the the less urgent. And then the next question would be to reduce the number of stones if it gets really tight. Right. Yeah. So yeah. we could target it towards older or more, just the more threatened resources if we needed to, but I won't necessarily put that on the table right away. <laughs> no, yeah, I, yeah. I think that if, you know, if they're like, oh, would you accept a hundred thousand or 80,000? And the answer would be sure. And maybe we then focus on, you know, 75 stones in each cemetery and, uh, right. could, you know, we could work with someone to identify really what those, those are and what the treatments would be. Yeah. What's the time frame for, what was it? hundred, hundred and... 125 each yeah you know the money isn't available until next july and so we we have a draft scope of work that's um you know we can almost recycle from what we did in west cemetery just in the last year or two and so uh, but in terms of i was thinking in terms of how long it actually takes to yeah yeah uh, 125 yeah that that time frame yeah that's what I was, yeah so it's interesting the uh, cleaning of the stones it's a multi-step process where they apply a cleaner a few times and it whitens it and takes off any growth and then they come in and they manually clean it and then they might reset it and so um if they i was saying that if we were ready if we could get it started quickly next year and then someone was selected in the fall they would probably 
they could work in September, October, November, they would then wait, come back in the spring and probably finish it by next October, right? So it's like a year if okay. you have that time. Okay. okay. I, I just always look at their, our cemeteries as a historical archive. And the fact that there would be questioned whether it's historic, you know, under the purview of the historical commission and CPA funds, uh, th uh, that's where I come from. It's it's, his, it's a historical archive. I walk through the South Amherst um, Cemetery from time to time, and the you know the families who lived here, what what they did, what century, um, they need to be preserved. Oh yeah, I, mean, I think I think Nate did a good job of of pointing out that you know that if I have this right, Nate, like essentially when when the stones are abandoned, they become property of the town right so then it's then then it's you know the town's responsibility to manage it and i made the argument that you know the information that's on the stones is um is in, integral to the integrity of the cemetery as a whole and you know that it has all sorts of purposes along with just you know knowing who's buried there it has to do with settlement patterns and the relationship of those um those areas for grazing even when they were great graveyards and um so hopefully hopefully our pitch will work <laughs> it was just it was just one voice <laughs> well thank yeah. you both yeah i think some of it was you know west cemeteries had a lot of attention and we did look at some stones with pvpc a few years ago in west uh, north and south and you know they they also need work and so i was just trying to you know build up those as well get those in, in nice repair yeah um, and then did you say that the, um, we talked a little bit about the, um, the area forms for the cemeteries that are pretty up to date? Yeah, I, uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission a few years ago when they looked at the stones, they also updated the inventory form. So they did more research on them. And so, okay. you know, I, I, it looks like actually it's the same research. They, the cemeteries were kind of formed at the same time. Uh, they went through some of the same processes in terms of beautification or how they were used. Um, and so it looks like they use kind of the same reference sources, but I, it, it could be that a little more research is done on both of them individually. Okay. But So that's something that potentially um, commissioners could help with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I will say that I'm, I'm assuming the company that will bid on this will, there's only a few when we, when we looked at West Cemetery, if we get the funding, there's not many conservators who will, will do a small job, small, they just consider like a smaller job. So, um, you know, there's only two or three in the region that would, you know, in the next, say like 30, 40 miles radius that would actually bid on this. Um, okay. Yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. The fact that there's um, potentially, uh, we could run out of conservators. Yeah, or we just have to, you know, right kind of cast a wider net, but it is interesting that the one firm we did used to use is out of the Berkshires, like I said, at that CPA meeting. And I think their their principles are tired and I'm not sure what they're doing. I think they're changing their work a little bit. And then Ludlow Memorial, who we've been using, you know, they they said they've been bidding on stuff. A lot of it's in Eastern Mass and, you know, uh -huh. New Hampshire and just all over. Right, right. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any questions from commissioners? Okay. Uh, so the East Amherst Local Historic District Study Committee. Take it away, Nate. Sure. Yeah. The um the local historic district commission. You know, there's two local historic districts in town. There's one around the Emily Dickinson um, National Register District around the homestead and the Evergreens. It's 40 or so properties. And then there's a the Lincoln Sunset North Prospect District, which is uh, a little less than 200 properties. And the local historic district study committee or commission has thought, well, could there be others? And, you know, we've looked at East Amherst. It's actually one of the older, oldest village centers in town. And a lot of the homes are still, um, they might have some vinyl siding, but the structures themselves are, you know, um, 18th century, um, early 19th century. And so the National Register District is about 40 properties, 35 properties. And that's kind of the starting point for going through the process of studying the properties again, update, you know, I'm basically redoing all the inventory forms with research and then um, submitting a study report to Mass Historic to create another local historic district. And Chris Skelly is the consultant. He submitted a, a price proposal 
he actually had worked for the Massachusetts Historical Commission for a number of years. And now he's an, uh, a private consultant. And so he's really familiar with this work and what the Massachusetts Historical Commission would need. And so you know, he provided a cost estimate and the commission is basically asking for CPA funding to, um, you know, we can't, because of his price quote, it's over 10,000. We'd have to seek quotes from other professionals, but he, he provided it, you know, what for his, his service, scope of service, what it would be. And so the commission has made that funding request. It's not, it's not too much, um, you know, and what, what we told the CPA committee, what we're going to get out of it could be, you know, up to 50 new inventory forms. So it could be that, you know, it'll be a pretty, a pretty great uh, resource, whether or not a district is adopted, at least we would have had research done on these properties and then also a narrative written to strengthen the National Register nomination. So, uh, you know, some of it is just this, that publication and research base. So is there gonna be overlap and actually for, would, you, would, it, be, would it be possible to pull up um, macros maps and just show the current, East, so there's an east the East Amherst National Register District, which we're also working on expanding. Mm -hmm. So is this sort of like a tighter number of properties within the center of that? And is there overlap between those two projects? Yeah, let me just there is some overlap. I will say that um, PVPC is we never we um, we're still working on what you know um, having them complete more work and so you know the the thing here would be that the uh the funding would become available until next july okay let me share my screen if this is visible what's outlined in red here is the existing now it's kind of you know orange this is the um, east amherst national register district and the idea would be to expand it um, possibly to some other areas. You can see what's now orange. And that's what PVPC had looked at. And so the study, the local historic district commission, we walked to the neighborhoods, we spent um, two site visits and there, you know, there is potential maybe to get to the Fort River, you know, um, the Massachusetts Historical Commission would look for natural breaks and settlement patterns, whether that's along, you know, um, natural features or other things. And so, you know, we, we, had, we said, well, maybe we'll stay, you know, we'll use this as a starting point, but right, maybe we'd, we'd fit, you know, go down to Spalding or up, up to the Fort River. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not, you know, I think some of it's yet to be seen exactly how, where, you know, what are the boundaries? Uh, you know, some of it was, well, okay, if a lot of the buildings in here are pre-Civil War, uh, you know, is Spalding Street a little more, um, you know, more modern, if you would use that term. And so okay. some of it would be saying, okay, what, you know, what's mm -hmm. the, what, what time period and what are the homes? What's the character? So, yeah, I mean, I don't, I think, I think really to justify the boundaries, you have to almost look at the neighboring properties and determine why or why not, why are they in and why are they not in? So, so drawing just kind of a general area for a local historic district, what would that look like? Would that be sort of a smaller, tighter section or would it just be related to the dates of the buildings? I mean, why would you have, wh why, how can you justify the boundaries? Well, I'm just curious if the boundaries for the, the local historic district would be as expansive as the National Register District or would it be a smaller subset? I think it would be, at, you know, probably as expansive as the one that's highlighted in orange now, and it could be bigger. Okay. I, I you know, like I said, I think you'd have to, you know, uh, Mass the Massachusetts Historical Commission wouldn't, um, you know, they don't like leaving out property. So for instance, you know, um, there's a few newer areas, newer homes here, right? But, you know, up here, these are, this is, you know, the original, I think it's right here is probably what was the original post office building. It's an old house here, farmhouse here. Yeah. So, you know, realistically, if you wanted to capture these three, they would say, well, you know, you'd capture these these few right here. And then it, you, right. know, you have, a, you know, a congruous district. And so, right. yeah, that's where, you know, um, that's, those are kind of the decision-making points. Yep. And um, is my understanding correct that 
currently, I think I remember working with Shannon last year that they were working on the expanded properties, but then MHC came back and said they wanted updates to, so the expanded plot properties being in blue right now, they, right. That they wanted updates to um, what's in red because those are relatively old forms. Right. So that's part right. of part of what we're up against. Okay, so we have these kind of two, two projects going on simultaneously. So um, I it, I can see how that would help with what PVPC was trying to do is expand, and then this other study can come in and start revising, maybe adding properties in the in the red. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions from Pat or Michaela or Hetty? Are you all familiar with Macris Maps? I know Hetty is. Oh, of course. I pulled all of yeah. the. Oh, that's right. When I was working on the, the yeah. um, North Prospect. Um, yes. And I think this is, you know, I, you know, I think it's very clear what the possibilities are for this. Okay. My, my comments are, are really more about um, the sort of village villages that are growing up in Amherst around these sort of key parts of the north, south, east, west kind of coordinates. Um, and the East Village has some really interesting places, buildings, it has really mm -hmm. interesting history. It's where we're going to have a new school. Um, I know that parents are concerned about walks to school from home. Um, so anything that will augment that experience um, for people who live there, um, who go to school there, who um, find that they're shopping there at the little stores on um, Route 9 um, on College Street there. You know, I think I think and I think something like this heightens awareness of the history of the area. Um, so I'm all for it. Great. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I definitely think it's a really good idea too. I did have a question. Um, you were talking about those like various ages of the buildings. Is there, is the historical district any reason for it to be separated out by era of building or? Is it just all one protected area? Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, I think that's what Robin was asking. It's like, I guess if we focus on a certain time period, then the district could be, you know, pretty small. And it, it you know, some areas it's really clear that this neighborhood or this area was, you know, a, there was a period of significance that also was contained similar architectural styles. I think in this East Amherst, that's where the, you know, when we're walking around, it was kind of like, well, where, where do you stop? You know, if you keep going up Main Street to Spalding Street, you're starting to get into, um, say it's mid 19th century or later, is that still relatable to what's around the common itself? And so, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think that's for, really for the study committee, you know, um, but you could, you could say, okay, we're gonna focus on um, pre-Civil War or what, you know, whatever, if there's a break in style and time period, you know, what, you know, I, so I think that's, um, in Amherst, what's interesting is the way there's been infill and new pro new developments, new neighborhoods, new houses, you know, we really don't have something that's so discreet as, oh, this is, you know, the whatever, the federal style neighborhood with brick homes or something. It's been, you know, kind of a, a heterogeneous mix of architecture and styles. And so that makes it a little, a little trickier sometimes, but yeah, and then my understanding is that MHC will, there'll be a dialogue back and forth about what they feel like is appropriate given the resources selected, you know, what the um, the context and the time period is. And um, it, it all has to be justified in in the writing, but yeah. Right, yeah, there's a, typically you have to inventory all the properties, uh, survey property owners, hold a public meeting or two, write a preliminary study report that includes justification of the boundaries and architectural styles. And that that's what mass historic reviews and then through a back and forth and then maybe more public process, there's a final report that's submitted. So, right, they have a chance to weigh in on why you're choosing those boundaries. Yep. 
Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, um, next up is discussion of one and five year goals and comments on the draft preservation plan. Um, I am still working my way through it. Um, so I apologize that I don't, I haven't actually, I've been working through my way through the history. <laughs> I haven't gotten to the goals part, but I, Nate, I did send you right before the meeting started. Um, um, and I can let uh, commissioners know that I'm, I have uh, a little, just a little very short um, Google form survey to um, just kind of take everybody's temperature on what they think is important for us to focus on the short term and the long term. So I'm hopefully gonna get that sent out this week. Um, but if you have that document. Yeah, I'll share my screen. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, so for commissioners, I think that, you know, this goes hand in hand with the preservation plan and we could help PVPC if we wanna restructure some of the action items. Um, they did ask if we had comments on the plan to get them to them soon because they're hoping to finish this year and it's already November somehow. Um, <laughs> I'll let them know, Robin, that there'll be comments coming I think that's great. I mean, I've, I've looked at it at kind of a higher level. I haven't really done, sometimes I really want to sit down and just do a deep read and I haven't um, uh, yet. I, I've tried to to uh, really review it in its entirety and I need to go back and make notes, but there were certain things that, you know, there was a question of should Jeffrey Amherst be mentioned as the namesake of the town? I don't think that's a question. That's history. Um, but there are other areas about indigenous folks, about the black community, um, and other other historical aspects of Amherst that there are notes that it needs to be expanded. So I guess my question is is the the um people who are working on it now will will be the ones expanding it, or do they want suggestions from us I, I wasn't clear on what that question was yeah i think we had we were hoping that uh, pvpc would have done a little research there and then um and then it might be that that becomes uh an action item you know that uh that's something the commission or you know we would the you know the community would follow through with so you know we didn't have enough funding for them to do a you know a a thorough research on that but if they if they you know there was say if they've done some research and they said yeah there's you know there's other stories here that haven't been told or research that isn't done then i think that becomes part of you know their five-year plan in the in the um so yeah i don't i wouldn't expect them to do an exhaustive research of that but just identify that you know those you know whether it's a certain group of people or time period or something that it wasn't in any of the documentation that was provided so they you know, they researched uh, and reviewed the plans and sources we have, and they may have said, okay, yeah, here's where there's missing pieces. And so then that becomes part of what, you know, it's part of the next kind of action items to do. Right, and Nate, I guess what I was looking for in those areas where they say, um, this needs to be expanded upon or, or whatever, um, maybe some bullet items about where the expansion, where, where, where they're gonna look to expand it would be helpful. Yeah, and uh, Pat, I, I don't know uh, if you work with track changes in Word, that's what I've been doing. I'm just going through and, um, you know, writing in my comments or suggestions for editing. And I'm just going to submit that back to them as, you know, my version with comments that they can kind of follow along with and, you know, use as they see fit. So that's one, that's one option to get um, comments back to them. Right, right. Well, I, I will work on that next. First, I thought I needed to digest it all. I it's, know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit a lengthy. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit lengthy. And, yeah. and um, you know, uh, two years well, ago, I'm okay. part of a group that asked me to to speak to the, the plan. And so I, I'm really familiar with the original plan. But but I'm I'm I was interested to see these areas where it was recommended that there be expanded information. It just would be helpful to know what areas are cons considered for expansion. Um, and it, I mean, you, that raises a question in my mind, which is sort of a question, a question that I'd like to take the temperature of everybody is, 
um, is some of the, I found some of the history to be a little bit too expansive and a little bit too, too detailed. And, you know, I'm making those comments as I go along, but um, it, I was a little bit overwhelmed by that piece of it. And it may be just because I'm um, reading so closely and not skimming, um, but um, I'd just be curious what people thought about, if they had any comments on that. Well, part of my initial reaction, Robin, was that there didn't seem to be a balance to the areas that were more developed than others. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were I, some I, areas that that were just total, totally in detail, and, and repetitive in different sections, and then there were other areas that seemed to be more cursory. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think yeah. the problem is that as you read what you think is a narrative, um, it's only slowly becomes clear that the narrative is leading to a point that's related to the architectural history of Amherst. And, you know, I, I noticed that sort of 20, 25 pages into the document, and that's about as far as I've got now as well. Yeah, so we're, we're, where all, I am, so. we're all in the same boat. Yeah. Um, and it, it does speak to Robin's point that it, it, it needs to get to the nugget or the bullet point, as you say, um, Pat, about, you know, what's, what's really critical, you know, so that the, so that, you know, you get to the, you get to the meat of the, of the information, um, especially if we want to consider how it's going to be used by all sorts of different people. Um, and Hetty, I agree with you. I think in writing any document, the original paragraph, the first paragraph in each section has to have the meat. Mm -hmm. And then it gets fleshed out after that. Because if, if it's not in the first paragraph or two, we're not going to get a lot of people reading this. Yeah, no, I think that was one of the things that I struggled with was that sort of, you know, that structure that just kind of leads you to the next thing. And I think maybe just, just it's just a much, I mean, I'm a little bit surprised that they're intending to finish by the end of the year just because it seems like more of a first draft than a kind of closer to final draft. But um and, and it seems to me that they used the 2005 document and embellished it. Um, maybe that isn't the right word to use. And I'm not being critical. I, I know how difficult it is to, oh, to yeah. construct something like this. So kudos to the group that's doing it. But th those are my thoughts as I read it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Nate, did you have any comments? No, I mean, I might actually send them the link of this meeting after just, I think there's been some nice things said, you know, I, it's funny, um, months ago, you know, I, I thought the draft was like 17 pages and I was like, oh, it's a little, little light. Um, this was like in the summer. I was like, oh goodness. <laughs> uh, but then all of a sudden when they shared the draft before the recent meeting, I was like, okay, yeah, now it's, uh, now it's grown. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess, yeah, I, I guess I was. I, I think Pat, to your point, I was hoping that uh, maybe we'd have more direction in terms of what was missing. And so more than a note that it was missing, but almost where to look or, um, you know, like, oh yeah, we, you know, we did look into these families or we did some initial research and, or maybe that can be the bullet points, you know, where, of how to do this. Um, no, and I think it, yeah, I yeah, I don't, I don't know how how to truncate it. I mean, we're running into this. We're updating the town's open space and rec plan, and we have the we have to do the housing production plan, and those end up being really big documents. I mean, hundred plus pages, and you know, it could be that some of that information gets into the appendix, or there's a good executive summary at the beginning, or we can structure the subsections of the report. Uh, and make it clear with a table of contents of where to jump quickly to get information. I mean, I don't, you know, I, you know, I don't know if those are the things that could help a reader because it may be that, you know, if we can structure it in a way, it could be like, oh, I don't even, you know what, I don't, if I really want to know what are the action steps here, here's where we are. If here's, here's the section on whatever I can jump there as opposed to trying to 
figure it out by going through the whole document. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking because I was working on it yesterday. Like I was on the section of um, the JCA, which I I think they were just you know probably like I mean just to give a specific example, like four or five sentences worth of content that was just just too detailed and not really, you know, not really helpful to the purpose of the plan. Like you need, you know, sort of more broader strokes about, you know, a community. And, and so I'm making those comments as I go along, but um, it's good to have, yeah, uh, it sounds like we're all on the, all on the same page and trying to figure out a good structure that would work. Um, yeah, and there is a wealth of information there. Yeah. And we hate, hate to lose that, but I go back to what I said about encapsulating the meat in yeah, the first no, couple of paragraphs. And then, no. um, you know, having having kind of a, a forward to what follows that this is this is the, you know, the detail of, of what yeah. what made this yeah. the first three paragraphs happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. It would be much more readable and, and anyone in the public wanting to read it would understand the format and get what was important at the beginning and some of the background information is interesting and you wouldn't i wouldn't want to lose that but i don't want to have to wade through it right to get right. to the meat yeah. um and i would say with that in mind also since it is november 13th um i know i'm going to be pushing myself to um get my revisions off to nate and uh, by the end of the week. So, um, you know, whatever, I think whatever you can get done, if you want to submit anything, maybe aim for that, aim, aim to admit, submit something <laughs> by then <laughs> so that we can help them, um, you know, move forward. I'll try to consolidate my comments tonight because yeah. I, I won't have time to go through and redline. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but th that my comments apply to the whole document. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Hilda has her hand raised, Robin. Oh, okay. Uh, we recognize Hilda. Can I see your faces again? I've got, I've just got the screen in front of me. And uh, anyway, what I want to say what's, what seems to me missing on this list is two things. One, especially with regard to East Village, is all the industries that used to be there and are now gone. It's, it, it's very reminiscent of the of the Mill River up here, and one of them, the first, one of the earliest ones that I know about is Preserved Clap. In the 18th century, he had a clock shop on Northeast Street. His name is very well known in the clock books among people who collect clocks. I happen to have one of his, which we went all the way up to Vermont to find, but. But I don't think people know anything about him, and he lived in that neighborhood in, a, in the 18th century. And then wasn't there a carriage factory? And was it uh, President Grant who went to his inauguration in an Amherst coach? I, I may have this couple of stories all mixed up here, but I thought that carriage factory was on the corner of Northeast. And Maisie, if my husband was alive, he would tell me I'm all wrong and he'd give it to you right. But but he, he did work on the original um, East Amherst Historic District. And so the other thing that's missing is the people there. We had owned and restored back in the 70s and sold it a couple of years ago, the, what was called the Beehive. And it says on the front, Smith House East, which Macris has deep into the 19th century, and it's very clearly a federal house from the inside and the outside. In any event, they call that the beehive because of all the children of the workers from the factories that lived in that building. Anyway, I just wanted to add that because I didn't see anything about people or industry on the list. Right. Beehive is mentioned in the in the document and that's and I was, I, 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 yeah but but it might not be under the right area i so, i so think they you. fit under the by clock watch but i didn't want to say it but I, I think that's what they fit um i think from the stories that i have heard um nate as far as um hilda forwarding any information about the east village um 
should she send 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 things to you? I mean, if well, yeah, if yeah. I mean, if she sends them to me, I can, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Can my them husband knew all anymore. of that stuff, and to me, I've got my brain doesn't work anymore. <laughs> but I would love it if I could see you and not look at the list. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, oh, I, I'll, I can uh, stop sharing if that's if we're, I was going to have people look at the list, but we can. Uh, yeah, we we'll get, we can get back to that. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Take, take that for what it's worth. Okay. Hilda, thanks, yeah, so. Hilda, you've Thank done you, that before. Hilda. If you have any documents you want to bring to town hall, I can copy or scan, or I can then I can share. Yeah, I have a thing that that the people from Deerfield brought me about just a picture of a preserved clock clock. And I you can come look at the clock. It's a very it has a silver face and a very beautiful cherry with flame finials case, which probably didn't go with it, but it looks nice. Thanks, Hilda. Okay. So getting back to this uh, potential list of one year and five year goals, if you want to bring that up again. Mm -hmm. This will be on the survey that you guys get. Um, but that's just what I had come up with general as, as a general list. Um, to give folks an idea, I've learned a lot both in my when I uh, in, when I entered last year for the Berkshire. Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. I worked with, um, or to develop this um, uh, guide on the status of all their historic district, uh, historic and historic, historical and historic district commissions. And what I realized at that time is one of the main um, jobs of local historical commissions is to keep their inventory updated. So um, in I've been batting around different ideas with different members of the commission. And so that's what's uh, under inventory updates. Um, I think everybody knows that I started working for MHC um, about a month ago. And um, so now I'm learning that like one of the things that needs to be updated in an inventory is demolished buildings. And um, that's probably not even just the most recent ones, uh, pretty much any demolished building unless um, a local commission or someone else uh, sends information to the Mass Historical Commission, they don't know that it's been demolished. So that's one area. Um, we talked about researching marginalized communities more fully, um, looking toward the more recent past, looking at more modernist structures. Um, I think Hetty has, Hetty, both Hetty and, uh, and Madeline have more expertise in this area and can speak to um, trying to begin to identify uh, buildings that I think, you know, we're making this transition in historic preservation, moving um, where, you know, the, the kind of what we classically think of as, you know, like the Victorian period and those sorts of things are receding further into the past and things that were more recent are now becoming historically relevant. So that's why that's there. Um, I put cemetery updates again, if that's necessary, um, the East Village and then the Lincoln Sunset. So those are all areas where um, we could all potentially, uh, if we wanted to volunteer time, help um, update the inventory. Um, Nate, I don't know when we did a National Register nomination, and I know MHC has certain expectations for a community before they'll entertain one, <laughs> but um, I thought that might be a good thing for us to consider maybe in, under the five-year plan of, of thinking what we might put up for nomination um, next and whether we wanna delve into one of these kind of newer areas, whether it's focusing on um, a marginalized community or something modernist or, um, so those are some thoughts there. Um, we've talked about our preservation restriction policy. That's probably a one year goal. It'd be good to get that set. <laughs> That's related to the CPA. Um, uh, so CPA funding requires uh, preservation restriction, um, but the terms are, I guess, up to the town um, and there are easier and harder ways to do it. Um, affirmative maintenance, which is sometimes called demolition by neglect uh, bylaw, that's to um, put into law a um, 
it, I mean, that that's, that's again, probably a five-year, five-year goal, because that really involves not only pulling together a bylaw, but um, having uh, the town's buy-in on enforcement. It's no use to have a bylaw if you don't bother to do any enforcement. If you can't afford to do any enforcement, then um, maybe not the best use of, of resources. Um, Shannon Walsh, when I was working with her at PDPC, was talking about this um, deconstruction movement. Um, do you want to explain that what that is, Nate? You know, probably know more about that than I do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I you know, I think. Um, I mean, it says that parenthetically salvage and reuse. I think there is, um, you know, it's probably a, a, an intersection of both kind of sustainability and life cycle costs. And then also, you know, what's better than, you know, a, a, an alternative to demolition may be reusing things. And so, you know, actually having a bylaw on the books would be more than, uh, you know, I have a little bit more regulatory teeth than say we could try to condition a demolition or something, but um, you, you could call out certain parts of that. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I, I think that uh, this could actually, like I said, um, probably work with a few different boards and committees on that uh, to see where, you know, I think it could meet a few goals of different parts of the town. Uh, but I mean, that that's, that's basically it. Um, you know, some of it would be again the funding mechanism for it and getting kind of a uh, um, like a program in place or something. But yeah, maybe um, also just talking with another community that has implemented one recently and kind of seeing what their implementation has looked like. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. for instance, like the um, you know, forty-five and fifty-five South Pleasant. It's like, you know, we'd want the applicant to come back with a, you know, more documentation of the buildings and that could help if, if there was a bylaw in place um you know even I, the building commissioner thinks we could do it with our demolition bylaw but say if there was something here we could amend our bylaw to actually uh, require certain documentation um, i feel like a bylaw like this would be doing that right you'd you'd have to have pretty thorough documentation uh in order to move something like that forward but at least you'd have the documentation in, um in hand yeah yeah um yeah, I was thinking of the um, a house that was demolished on um, on Main Street near the um, well, where the new apartments have gone up, just down from the Emily Dickinson. There were right. so many, you know, beautiful doors and cabinet doors and doorknobs and you know, who knows where any of it went. <laughs> and that's a that's a little that that's a little heartbreaking too. So. It appears that the house next door to that project is also now part of that project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Judging from as I pass by the, the numbers, um, there's I could be wrong, but it seems that way. But I think you're right, Robin. There was a lot that could have been preserved yeah. and, and reused. Yeah. Um, do you want to scroll down a little bit, Nate? So there we go. Um, then outreach ideas, um, we talked about walking tours. Um, Madeline had mentioned something called um, Jane's Walks, which are, I always get this wrong, Jane Jacobs. Um, uh, in May, in the weekend in May, um, it's sort of a, a, a nationwide invitation for communities to put on small informal um, history walks in their neighborhoods just to sort of promote uh, promote the knowing of the past. Um, our barn outbuilding and assessment program, an event. Um, um, Hetty and I met with Jane Wald and Jan Mar Markart um, over dinner, and I uh, am trying to <laughs> rope Jan into helping volunteer to um, try to get this barn event happening next May. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to ask you, Nate, is if it's possible for us to get some sort of mailing out to the properties that were on the barn and outbuilding survey that PDPC did, since we have, um, I could either, if we have a list of, of I know I have that um, report. I'm not sure if there's an ex easy Excel spreadsheet to, or I could just, you know, pull out, strip out the, the addresses, but whether that's something that the town would consider doing to alert people to this program that's been on 
available for funding since um, July, but um, we haven't, we, we, I <laughs> haven't moved forward on actually fully promoting it and trying to get somebody in to get their barn assessed, so. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, I mean, it might, we, it might just take a little bit of manual work to get the mailing labels or, you know, I don't think there's a spreadsheet, but it's not too bad to, you know, be able to do that. So, um, Raya, Robin, if you and I, we can work together and try to get something going, um, you know, this winter or this, you know, the next month or two, we could get a mailing out. Okay. And then the next thing that um, I would put on my list of things to do would be to, to I know that I, I had a conversation with one assessor who he lives in the Pennsylvania area, but he would, you know, if he had one or two, two, you know, like two, two properties to visit in one weekend, um, he'd consider traveling up here. And then I worked with the, um, the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. They have a barn assessment program and I think Vermont does too. So I can pick their brains about who might be able to be willing to travel so that we could, um, you know, have a list of, of vendors available for people who are interested in the program because it's kind of not worth anything if you don't have an appropriate vendor. Yeah. So, um, so that's that. Um, one of the ideas that I had was uh, trying to create some sort of publicity. I mean, this is a really the national. I think it's the National Preservation Trust does um, uh, top ten endangered buildings. Um, there are five to thrive lists. I think Preservation Mass does one of those. And I was just thinking of if there were something like that that we were interested in doing as members of a committee to, you know, find maybe maybe three um, three buildings just to highlight in Amherst. Um, one of my favorites is the um, I don't know if it's a power station building where. Um, um, the cable station used to be, mass media used to be, or Amherst Media rather. Um, on College Street? Uh, on Route 9. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I love that building. I think it really, you know, it's just such a, um, it's such a strong facade um, that, you know, kind of telegraphs its, its time period in a, in a way that's different from a lot of buildings in the center of town. So, um, that's that idea. And then MHC has a preservation award nomination program. And I think last year, or maybe the year before, I wanted to nominate um, Simple Gifts Farm. And I, I don't know if they get like, there's like, it's like, I think it's five years from when a preservation project completes. But um, that's something that we could consider. And maybe that's also like a five year plan, because it's not like every year we're going to have a preservation project that's nomination worthy. But um, and then commission related things I've been wanting to do is get a training guide for commissioners together um, and then also pull together a preservation funding guide so that um, when we have um, applicants looking for CPA funds, we can also direct them to other sources so that uh, we can maximize our, our funding. So that'll go out in a survey to everybody and um, there'll be an opportunity for you to just put your notes in too. So, um, Thanks for taking a look at that. And now, um, well, we covered macros inventory a little bit. Nate, I sent you one more thing, a little graphic. Um, I just wanted to show everybody, I managed to get um, a download of the macros inventory, which includes the recording dates. I did this for all the um, commissions in the Berkshires last summer, and I thought it was such a fascinating, um, way to look at the data. Basically, somewhere in the mid 90s, I think, MHC changed their um, inventory guidelines for what um, a form B should look like. That's a basic inventory form. And um, anything before, so anything before 1990 is definitely um, out of what they would consider out of date. Um, and so if you look at this pie chart, you can see that first. Um, darker blue triangle and the orange triangle. That's from the 1970s and the 1980s. And so that's over 700 inventory forms that are um, considered out of date. Um, we've actually got a good number in the, what was that, the 2010s. Uh, um, so we were 
done some good updating. Some of those, some of those properties might be update updated already, but it still gives you a visual sense of what our inventory looks like and um, what uh, ideally uh, an updated inventory would be um, just like 19, 1990s on. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to share that. Um, and we can talk more about as when, when we come up with our our goals, we can talk more about how we want to target research and prioritize things in terms of inventory updating. Do you have any thoughts on that, Nate? That's a big number. Um, yeah. <laughs> Some of them are demolished. <laughs> so, yeah. You know. I mean, it is, it becomes apparent when, um, you know, if, if uh, you know, there's a demolition application or if someone asks about a property and we have the paper copies on file in town hall and you pull out a form and there's just like a one sentence description on it and you realize, yeah. okay, there really isn't a lot of research, even though, you know, we can say a lot of properties have been inventoried or documented. A lot of times it's pretty cursory or sometimes it's just a picture from the sixties or seventies uh, and the person's, you know, the like a sentence on the family that lived there at the time. And so, um, you know, I think, <clears throat> yeah, it's too bad that, at, you know, there may be, Maybe difficult to find primary sources at the same time. A lot of things have been digitized, and uh, certain research is now made easier than it was 30 years ago. So, yeah, no, I, I think it is important. I think at some point we have to, it'd be nice to, um, you know, we can maybe look at some of those inventory forms or maybe do it thematically by areas of town or something, and we could start approaching it that way because, you know, otherwise it just seems really daunting when you look at how many there are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, I know that um, uh, Chris Skelly, when I was working for him last summer, I mean, he did something for, I don't know how many of these he's done, but it's actually a, um, it's a, so right, so when you, when you set forth, like we're doing in the East Village, uh, East Hammers Village, um, to do a survey, that's called a survey, and you, the, the things that you create, that, the, those are the form Bs that become the inventory. But he does something called a survey plan where you where he, where he works to rank or you know he and the community that he's working with work to rank what's worth a deeper dive, you know, so that if you um, I mean, we talked about it in uh, I think we were in Clarksburg um, with a much smaller community, you know, to sort of get them started on inventory and you'd have this plan as to, you know, well, let's take a look at what your resources are. They're, they're tiny. So um, that's a little bit more manageable, but then you really, then you figure out which ones you want to target first, you know, so you get kind of a one, two, and three. So I was thinking that might be something, you know, down the line that we might want to consider doing with all those forms that need updating is sort of like, which ones are really critical and which ones, um, you know, are, are, are less so. So that was a thought. So I have a, I have a thought. When yeah. I represented the historical commission with the um, Sunset Prospect Lincoln Avenue and got them jump started with the, all the form B's on North Pleasant Street of those buildings we're concerned about. Yeah. They, as a as a local commission, um, assigned properties to each one of the commissioners to delve deeper, and so that may be a, a, a model that we could use with the other historic commissions, um, local commissions. Um, but also, I, I have a, a throwback question. 45 and 55 South Prospect. Um, Nate, you forwarded us some, some historical information on both of those buildings. Will that become part of the Form B macros? What's going to happen to that information? Yeah, right now it just lives locally. Um, and I think it would take, uh, you know, we have to amend the form B and submit it. Um, I think most of it's probably been verified. It just, you know, take a little bit of work to kind of put it all kind of make it, you know, um, to tie it into the form B. I think the narrative and some of the information, um, could go in, but then, you know, there's some miscellaneous notes and some other things for each property that I, you know, we, you know, I'd have to, you know, just filter it a little bit, but. Right. But the developer, we charge the developer with 
doing that. So could they, as Barry Robertson, et cetera, but could they be responsible for doing what you just described? Yeah, I think I, I mean, I don't know. I, I thought I did. I'll follow up. I, I, I want to follow up with them just to see where they are, um, just to kind of remind them or talk through with, you know, the applicant and uh, the attorney where what they could be doing. Right. And, and we have been provided this information by a third party. Right. And so if it's shared with them, they may be asked to take responsibility to finalize the form B, incorporating all of it. So can I jump in, if that's OK? I mean, having written a historical and architectural description for form Bs at PVPC, um, like a, a narrative, a narrative, a historical narrative description. By the time I got done with working there, it took me about four hours. I mean, that's doing the research and writing it. Like you know, if I'm working at a really good club. Um, so I mean, I know Hetty and I talked about maybe you know one of the responsibilities of the commission would be to you know kind of learn how to write these up in a way that MHC wants to see them. And when we get a demolition request, you know, make a commitment as a commission to finalize, you know, a revised form B, if that's, if that's something that we want to do. Um, because I think handing it off to different developers, it, I mean, it's just not their training area. And my understanding is that MHC has, you know, pretty specific, specific requirements on what they'd like to see. <laughs> and, you know, now that I have a lot of experience with that, I can certainly, um, you know, work with people and on, you know, kind of guide other commission members if they're interested in learning how to do that. But that's my only question about kicking something like that. Getting getting research materials is, is fantastic from any, any source whatsoever. Right. Um, but, but we need to do something with it. And the question right, right. is, who who does that and yeah. we charge the developer with doing that as part of the delay um and maybe they need to consult with mass historical commission and take that information to get it in a form that satisfies our request what are your uh, just thoughts? a thought yeah no i'm just curious what nate's um thoughts are because would they be submitted from the town or the developer or? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it'd be more on my plate, but I feel more comfortable doing it um, only because um, I think, you know, I probably, I, you know, I agree, Robin, that they don't have, not that I have great training myself, but they, more than them. And I think I would, could, you know, I often will communicate with Mass Historic just as, on different projects, so I think I'd have, I'd have had a have a better relationship and ability to do that. I, you know, we had asked them to do a little bit more documentation. I think that's something we could incorporate into it. So, you know, some of it would be, you know, are there other photographs or other things that we could attach and and wait for that to all be sent as one updated form. And I think that's a good point. Um, not not to jump the gun, but because I know it's on the agenda. But I walked by. 45 um, South Pleasant, the one with all the um, artwork on the outside, the murals. And I would like to see a structural report for that building. I mean, that's in decent shape. It's right. in really decent shape. And I don't know why we didn't ask for that before, um, in fact, because it's, it's a little concerning to me that we may have jumped the gun and just uh, given them a six month delay, you know, with documentation, but a principal piece of documentation could be, you know, the request to prove certain things about the condition of that building in order to demolish it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, after so the I'm hearing, not, I'm I... sorry to, to push the agenda because I know it's coming, but. Um... No, I think, you know, talking about inventory forms, I think that, uh, after you know, after the hearing, I was speaking with the building commissioner, and it could be that we would want to change the bylaw. Uh, we just you know had it amended for the uh, preservation bylaw, but we could put in there what we would want, what what are required forms or documentation to be able to consider a demolition application complete. 
And, you know, we, we do it with other boards and committees. It sometimes it's, it's difficult to keep pushing it, but um, it could be that it is, you know, you, you don't want to put a, the burden, you know, and there's a range, right? There's homeowners who don't have a lot of resources or, so, you know, and then there's a developer or a project who, that might, but, you know, is right. How, how do we make it um, a prerequisite that there be a, say a, a structural engineer's report or better documentation or a completed inventory form or something. And so, you know, it, are, something. I, mean, I was going to say, if we make those a requirement, we still have the option to waive the requirement, right? The, as opposed to trying to think of what you might need right. when you have a list in front of you. So if you have, you know, a, a, you know, whatever the, you know, the women's club that doesn't have, you know, that, that kind of money to throw around or, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, you right. And so I think some of it could be written into the rules and regs uh, of the commission or in the bylaw. And then the building commissioner also thought it could be, you know, and, and, and um, you know, we often will allow kind of just to go ahead. He just said the commission could vote to allow demolition only if and after these five things were done. And, and it would have to be reviewed and, and um, say approved by the commission, right? So the, the conditions could be that there is a photographic documentation, there's measured drawings, there's an inventory form or whatever. Um, you know the the um, you know the hard the hard part there is you know is like would the applicant do the the research to get it done, um, and then what do you do with like you know does it change their opinion or not or do we just start you know do we issue a delay and still we try to require that you know it's a tricky thing right you know we right well you could make you know you could tie those things to an earlier ex you know earlier right. permit you know so right. you impose a 12-month delay with no documentation right. you know they get the documentation and they get the permit or <laughs> or he was saying that you know uh, the building commissioner saying, "Well, list the the really the all the things you want, and then basically it might take them ten months to get it anyways, and then they could demolish it as long as the commission approves of all the documentation." Uh, but it's hard. I feel like it's it's we're still kind of at the same end game, and it'd be nice to try to figure out what is there some other way. Um, but, right. So let's put that on a. Can we put that on a agenda yeah. item for the next meeting and yeah. maybe get more? Does does the I, I think it's worth discussing. Yeah, Definitely. no, I think it's worth discussing going for it. Does the bill, is the building commissioner, the building commissioner want to come and talk to us about it? I'll talk to Rob a bit more. Um, okay. You know, which is sort of what would be the most, it, it's such a, it's, it's so challenging. Um, I think because our town is so small, um, you know, having, an effective using using the demolition delay tool effectively. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another thing that I I you know, and if, if Hetty is regretting one thing, I'm sort of regretting the 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 possibility that we could ask for design review. If you sort of forget, we don't have the power to require design review, but we do have the capacity to ask for it in exchange for an earlier delay. So that's another thing. If we're concerned about what comes next fitting in within the historic character not in terms of use not what comes next you know there's i just think there's a lot of strong opinion about student housing around here and that's you know i don't think that that's our purview but but design review in terms of the historic context is and so that's one possibility that we could think about but it's almost like you know this is another thing that i've been meaning to sit down and sort of like how would you draw the map of you know, how to effectively use demolition delay in, in terms of these things, you know, the flow chart of like, you know, what, what do you want to require and, and what do you want to ask for to get the best outcome? Right. Yeah. So, right. So the building commissioner are saying that, you know, if you issue, a if the commission issues a delay, an applicant might just wait out the delay and really not right. do a great job of the documentation or other things that the commission had asked for. Right. And the delay expires, or he said, you can allow demolition conditional upon, you know, these requirements and a delay can't happen at all until the building commissioner has been notified that they've been met and it could actually take longer than a year, right? So oh, you have okay. to, be, yeah. you know, right? You have to, we want a completed inventory form, right? We want all those things, maybe Robin, what you just mentioned, some whatever, right? And those, 
you know, um, schematic drawings of what's to be, you know, the new building, um, right. you know, something. And then he, you know, his thought was at least then we get some documentation or research out of it. Um, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Let, let's put this on the agenda for the future. I think it's definitely worth um, pursuing. Yeah. Um, okay. So we were on macros inventory and then we went toward 45 and 55 South Pleasant Street, but we were looking for a uh, town common uh, update. And I, in particular, uh, was curious about the fountain, which I know Hetty and I talked about, and Hetty wrote about for the Indy, um, because it has this really interesting backstory of being um, this historical moment where, so we have this fountain. Where is the fountain, Nate? <laughs> has oh, it it's been? lost. No. Uh, it's, no. <laughs> yeah. it's actually, it's in storage. So, you know, for just a quick, update, you know, the town common right outside town hall. If you haven't seen it, you know, it's under under construction. And the idea was, is, has been for a while to remove the parking lot in front of town hall, put in kind of like a grass amphitheater, um, some new walkways, some a central sitting area, uh, you, you know, new lighting, new everything. And, and the fountain too also would get its own little plaza with uh, the, uh, the idea is to have some sitting around it and interpretive material. And so it would go back uh, pretty similar to its location where it was before. Yep. Okay. And so, um, yeah, so just uh, for the other members of the commission, um, I was researching a, there's a, I was researching a little park in um, Springfield when I was at PVC that has like four or five different monuments to like wars. And then there was this fountain and um when I think it had the name Willard associated with it, when I was looking through newspapers, I was like, well, these Willard fountains are showing up everywhere. Like, who's this Willard person? Um, and the woman's name was Frances Willard. And these were temperance fountains um, as a way of promoting the temperance movement, which um, as I read about it now occurred to me how much of a kind of a I always thought of temperance as sort of like a, a no fun uh, social movement. <laughs> and really, um, it was a really profoundly feminist approach to the problem of women who did not have control of the spending in their households and their husbands, um, if they had drinking problems or uh, at, that they would not only spend their household money, but also, you know, the behavioral issues um, that came along with that and women who couldn't get divorced or earn their own incomes, um, temperance was a way of addressing what was a really, um, a really a women's issue around problem drinking. And so these, they, there were, there are all these um, fountains came out. I think there might be one in, in Belcher Town. There's one in Springfield. And there's a website uh, where an intern pulled together um, them all over the country. And I, I mean, I never, I've never even saw it. It was, it was out before the, the, um, the construction, it was out there. I mean, I don't think I ever noticed it. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's not, yeah. When we say fountain, I mean, it's a, a smaller kind of monument. It's not, it's you like know, a, they were drinking fountains. Yeah, Sorry, when yeah, I was not, not, they were drinking I, fountains. Yeah, right. yeah, all of that. Yep, and that was the idea that you would get a cool drink of water. You know, it was this this metaphor for for the temperance movement, and they, some of them also had um, troughs for for dogs and yep. for horses at like different heights. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. So I I thought yeah yeah. So the plan is to celebrate it. I, I had a picture somewhere um yeah so it would yeah oh yeah here it is let me um i'll share my screen if that's visible yeah 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 i know I, I think yeah it's uh you know it wasn't it was the first thing removed you know it was carefully stored and so it would it'll go back um and you know we the, the town has, you know, there's a land water conservation fund grant that's supporting the 
renovation of the town common. And so uh, the hope is that it would be done by next uh, July 1. And so, um, you know, there, the contractor will probably stabilize the site over the winter. And then there's a lot of granite curbing and other things that uh, granite's been on a, a month, you know, many months back order. And so uh, we'll probably reach a stopping point. So what, what's happening now is they're doing all utilities, they're putting utilities underground. So new drainage, electrical, we'll have all new lighting. Uh, you know, they moved a flagpole. Actually, both flagpoles will be moved. Um, so, oh, Hedy, you're muted. I'm muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, is there specific drainage for the fountain? Because I think at one point there were there were some problems with the pipes in the fountain itself, and that was one of the reasons it got removed. I hope I have that right. Um, yeah, I'm hoping that. Are they are they thinking about that? I, that's what I want to be sure about. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, I thought it was. Let me make a note. I, uh, I thought the idea was to get it working again and have all the right plumbing. So you know, like mm -hmm. uh, you know, right? Put a yeah. So um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. I think it'll be really nice when it's done. Um, it you know, it's not just all the really cool stuff that Robin was talking about with the fountain. It's also that. The roads in Amherst, when that fountain went in, were completely different from the way they are now. They were really dusty roads. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of a cool drink of water is is sort of part of that idea that you know you, you know you got out of your buggy or your got off your horse and and there is this sort of attempt to to you know create a salve within a civic framework and i find that that idea very compelling um you know that 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 amherst wanted to be included in the towns or places that had those kinds of wtcu fountains um as well you know because the some of the historic photographs i've looked at the, the the main roads in amherst were you know really rutted they were like sort of rural roads up in the hill towns you know that aren't tarmacked or anything so I, th I think fountains make more sense when we think of them in that context and I see this as a lovely a lovely spot where people could learn about the history of Amherst Centre as it's historically known you know um, it's not just that we've taken out all the parking but right. We have all this other history that we want to share with you. Okay, anything else about the town common project? Okay. Um, we talked about barn tours and assessments, so we can move forward from that. Um, follow up with the Jones Library. Um, I know, Nate, I had a question for you uh, because we did our regulatory duty in terms of the preservation restriction and the exterior building, but I was hoping that we would have a return to interior changes, particularly given how productive our conversation was with the architects, because um, there were certainly some questions that we had, and like in particular, there was one room where they were talking about removing these beautiful divider doors and, and the question about where things, um, how things will be salvaged, um, where they will go, that, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I need to follow. Up with, I need to follow up with that actually. I, and then um, I, that was also on there because we had asked for a few submittals where they said they have samples. Yeah. Um, and we did review for the preservation restriction. One were the windows in terms of, uh, you know, true divided light or simulated divided light, and um, mm -hmm. uh, there's one or two other things that we wanted that they said they could provide to us. So I was just going to circle back with them. Did they have some synthetic slate too, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, when um, was it Marty uh, Smith mentioned that the visitor center at UMass was synthetic slate? I looked at it on Google Street View and then I went by and then, you know, it's like, wow, okay, it's it's really well. I, I, I can't believe she said it's a few, uh, did she say it was like almost 30 years old and it's, it really has aged well. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which is interesting because I worked on a house, you know, uh, um, doing stonework for a house in, in Long Meadow. And this is years ago, but 
you know, million dollar renovation. They used really what they thought was top of the line synthetic slate and it cupped and warped pretty quickly. Um, right. So, you know, I've spoken with some of the building inspectors and they said, yeah, that's the, that had been the case, but, you know, Amherst College is using it now and they think that it's, you know, they've, they've improved, improved it. And so um, I think they have, it's just one of those things, you know, <laughs> Rob, you, 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 you asked like two years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so 50 year warranty versus, uh, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really hard to get at what the cost benefit of that compared to a slate. But yeah, yeah it'd be nice to, I can follow up with that. Um, okay. The interior, and then, the, you know, they said they were going to have some right material submittals and samples. Did anybody have any other comments about? Uh, following up on the Jones Library project. Okay. No, I I must also our liaison to the design review board, so I get it from both sides. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thank you for your service. <laughs> I am very happy to do that. Um, any further comment on forty five and fifty five South Pleasant Street at this point? Right. I'd emailed the research that Mr. Wilford had conducted and some of it had been both the properties were part of a, um, you know, a display at the historical society a few years ago. And so uh, he said he had hoped to get it to us before the hearings, but he hadn't, um, you know, his hope was that at least the buildings would be celebrated before they came down. So he said, you know, he's, he understands there's change and things happen, but it'd be nice to, you know, celebrate them, whether it's more documentation or even have like a public, um, something public just to, you know, reference them again. So um, that's it. Um, my, yeah, my question, I mean, it, it's, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse. I just don't, I have a hard time with the histories understanding um, there was, you know, the buildings that, so just in terms of, 55. So the little brown one is 55 and um, the larger right. one is okay. just in terms of 45 that um, there was a building there that burned to the ground. The building that we see now replaced it like and what was it 1878 was the fire. Right, right. And then when did the annex come in? And so like these questions about Sweetser Hall, was it in the block that's on South Pleasant Street? Was it in the annex? Was it before the fire? Was it, I mean, the, the, the historical documentation that I've seen references it before the fire. And so if the building burned down and we're talking about a different building in the same place, <laughs> you know, I mean, it will be great for the form B, I think um, my biggest question was just, you know, had he had those pictures and I haven't been able to um, get over to get a look at that room with that arched ceiling and just really ponder what was going on there, whether that was concert hall or, um, you know, so there's just kind of some com confusion about what came first and when and what happened in which building, because the annex looks to me like it was just, you know, built as part of storage for the store but it has that funky little room so yeah i think yeah it's hard to um um you know i think the 55 the one on the street the red door salon building right so that you know had burned it was rebuilt as a one story but mimicked kind of the proud overhang the recessed entry and then it you know that was a one story and then it became a two story and then it changed its form again and um, you know, I think probably, I don't think it was, I don't think that it was demolished. I think it's probably added on to. So I think the structure that's there is probably the bones of it are from the 18, you know, late seventies, early eighties. And it was built the, the first thing, the first, uh, floor facade was meant to mimic what was there before, but it's really not the same building. Um, so it is kind of interesting. That's why I, you know, it'd be nice to have a little bit more documentation of the interior and the, the foundation or, you know, something that could try to show us what what's happened. The building in the back, you know, Ed Wilford's research, I was gonna see if I, I thought I downloaded, they're all, all such big files. I, I was having trouble today. Um, the, um, 
what is that 45 you know what, what i find difficult too is um or i think robin we talked about this with uh the demolition of the properties on southeast street you know the three homes that we looked at a while ago is that if the title and deed research stops you know you can make a story that ties it all together but it's hard to to ground it in <laughs> right in uh anything um and so let me just share my screen so i think what um what yeah so i mean i think in the other thing though is that you know there weren't newspapers in amherst right until the mid 19th century and so it's hard to you know ed was saying it's hard to carry some of this forward but for 45 South Pleasant, this is the brick building behind Hastings. You know, he's saying that he's pretty sure this is, you know, um, from a student at Amherst College that this building right here, my cursor is, yep. is the is the current building today. And now, you know, the street is now in front of it with all the new buildings, right? Because even the church isn't shown. And so, um, you know, that... So wait, which building are we talking about? Are we talking about the annex to 45 or... 55. Yes. Yep, 45. Okay. So this one is the one that's, you know, behind Hastings. So now, you know, now we have, you know, Hastings. So that came first before what's in front of it? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what year is that picture from? Oh, you know. That's interesting. Oh, oh I, um, I mean, I did look at this, but I just didn't make. Yeah, I I, I thought there was a date. It's a little faint. I don't, I'd have to look. Um, okay. No, I thought oh, I thought my annotations were deleted. So yeah, I mean, it is interesting that the um, the buildings would be made would be brought in front of it. I mean, they did they did move buildings, but it's just it's those are these are the things that you know are really you know hard to. Um, to to confirm, right yeah, yeah you know yeah. so it's like okay there is a, a drawing there's some newspaper articles there's you know some deed um right i mean and then there are all the maps right yeah, yeah. And, and, and sometimes so, the maps reflect i mean the, you know, a lot of times they reflect the basic shape of buildings right but it can be challenging i mean i do think that the the roof is interesting you know, and um, it's like you don't want to ask an applicant, but maybe Barry would be willing. Like, would he go in there and do a little exploratory demolition just to see what's what's there? Um, because you know, is there a little more proof that maybe there was a stage or something? Um, right, right. Or anybody with an architectural background who can talk about why you'd have a ceiling like that. Right. Right. Because it's weird. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think it is. It's just interesting oh, that. Yeah. What's that? I, yeah. I mean, to me, it's like, okay. Um, I just, there's a hard, it's hard to make that, that, that definitive connection and say yes. Um, but I think yep. uh, I like, I like the research that's happening. And yeah, I'll reach out. I have a note here to reach out to Tom and Barry just to. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if we could get in there too, I'd love to do it. Site visit, you know. I'll okay. bring my five. I'll bring my five pound sledgehammer and um, <laughs> some safety goggles. That's one of my uh, one of my classmates had this like you know camera thing where you could just drill a hole and you can, you know, it's like arthroscopy but for buildings, so that you don't have to. Right, right, right. <laughs> Actually, I think one of the building inspectors have they have something like that, so they yeah, can. They do, yeah. yeah. There's, there's, there could be, there could be love letters back there. It's happened before. <laughs> Looking at the drawing, um, I'm just, I'm guessing, I'm. This is off the top of my head here. That looks like it's a an early nineteenth century drawing. Um, yeah, I was gonna say early to mid nineteenth century. I yep. forgot. Yeah, I, I got to. Yeah. Uh, I'm just guessing. <laughs> um, yeah. And you see that the the building which is the greek revival you know gable front building it has a staircase an exterior staircase going up to the second floor mm -hmm. i've right. read about that right um in and relation the, to 55 right and that's the bricked in part that's mm -hmm. there now and ironically even in the earlier documentation of the hastings um 
building after it was constructed, uh, they they always talked about an exterior re uh, rear um, staircase, even mm -hmm. on the Hastings building, which is really interesting. And it's there now. And I'm like, huh. Yeah. Is that really like how old is some of that? Uh, some of that exterior stuff. I mean, I was looking at it afterward, and some of the metal is go is into the brick, and I'm like, huh, I wonder if that is actually, you know, a 150 year old steel beam that they've you know replaced wood on over the years. But it looks when I was looking at it, I'm like, it looks like it's actually part of the structure of the building. Um, and so yeah, just it, it would probably take a little bit more looking around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, um, Kayla also had a good point last time we talked about this with all of the artwork on that building. There are at least three different murals there by different people. They look like they're, you know, different um, hands behind the work, minds. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's, a, that's something else that needs documenting as part of what um, has come to be called the sort of the groovy, the groovy era in Amherst. Um, yeah. Do if, do you want to let us know if we can do a site visit, Nate? And that would give yeah. us an opportunity to take pictures inside and out. Right. And... To see, I think then, I think then some of this stuff some of this make more sense. Clearer to see, you know, that you can actually be in the in the space and imagine it being used by a fraternity at Amherst College for all sorts of interesting yeah. dramas and events um, yeah. from that time period. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Any other comments, folks? Okay. Um, so we have come to public comment. I see we have two attendees. Uh, if anyone is interested in making a public comment at this time, please raise your electronic hand. I'm not seeing any hands being raised. So, so there is no public comment at this time. Uh, any unanticipated items from uh, commissioners or Nate? No, okay. All right, then. Um, with that, I guess we can uh, actually we should uh, schedule our next meeting before we adjourn. Um, so, Nate, have you, I'm on the CPA committee, but um, I have not looked closely at the meeting and the agendas. Do we have a sense of when, um, Deliberations start. Just thinking in terms of if any any um, applicants would want to come before the historical commission, there would be a, a case to be making. You know, maybe having our next meeting the fourth of December. Yeah, and I I um have the meeting packet, but I actually don't see the schedule. I think Holly maybe sent that out separately. Um, yeah, I think that would actually probably, I was thinking later, but I think right the fourth would probably make sense because if we wait too long, then the CPA process <laughs> will be over. Yep. I guess. We've had one, one, two. Well, we won't meet Thanksgiving. The one thing I would say conflict-wise is I run the law review um, at Amherst and we have a speaker on the fourth, so I might not be able to come, um, but the conflicts are only for the neck, for basically only till the 18th of um, December. That after that, all the Mondays are fine, like for the rest of the year, but. And we could do a Tuesday or for instance. That would be great. Um, or any other day, but I also like don't want to, like it's only if it's, be yes. able to do it Tuesday. I was just, I'm in Boston Tuesdays and Wednesdays, but I sort of settled into a routine. I wasn't really sure. Um, I'll be very sleepy. <laughs> Gotten up at 4.30, but Tuesday is possible as well. Okay, sorry for the, the complication. 
Oh, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, Thursdays are out because that's CPA. So, um, and Wednesdays I'm driving back. So that's not a good day. So um, does Tuesday work for you, Nate? Um, are we talking about the fifth? Yeah. Yeah, that would work. Okay. Yeah, I can do the fifth as well. That work for you, Pat and Hetty? Uh, I might have to leave. Um, uh, it, it's not, it, I've got a conflict that starts at seven. Me too. Oh, okay. Oh, you also have a conflict on the fifth? Every Tuesday I have choir practice. Okay. Um, uh, so getting to, we need four of us for quorum. Mm -hmm. Um. So maybe the fourth is better without Antonia, but with everybody else. I mean, if we have Pat and Hetty leaving it, right? If Hetty yeah. can't make it, Pat at least at seven, that may basically means no meeting on the fifth. Right. I I can meet on the fourth. Okay. Yeah, me and too. Me, and Hetty. Okay. Okay. What time is the law review? Um, it it will. It's going to be from seven to eight, which is. Okay. I guess we could start the meeting earlier at six if we want to do some business from six to seven. I don't know if you want, if you have to prep for that, Antonia, or... My issues, I have to, since they're traveling here, I have to like greet them and such, but it's, sorry, I, I'll just won't come for that meeting, but I'll be here for the rest of the meeting, <laughs> sorry, the rest of the year. <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's hard balancing so, everybody's schedule, <laughs> especially in the holidays, so... <laughs> so we're going to meet on the 4th at what time, please? Yeah. 6.30. Okay. Thank you. And then there is a hand raised, um, Robin C. Kyung. Oh, yep. Uh, so we can recognize uh, C. Kyung Park. You can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yep. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Welcome. If you can identify yourself to the committee. Hi, everyone. My name is Shikyang Park. I'm from Amherst Zion Korean Church. And I was asked from CPA committee to attend tonight's meeting for a specific reason. Uh, Sam from CPA chair asked us to discuss with the historical commission and receive the guidance for the proposal on a roofing material. Okay, um, so I think the question at hand is that, um, and Nate, you can probably weigh in better than me on this, but um, the North Amherst Church uh, currently has a slate, does it have a slate roof on one side? Is it slate both sides? Yes, okay. most of the part has a slate on it, but okay. somehow, Small portion is uh, asked for shingle. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so the question is, um, what uh, roofing materials would be um, both allowable and, um, you know, and, and like probably the best economical choice? I think that uh, in the proposal, there was um, uh, an argument made that uh, asphalt could be considered uh, a historical um, surface. It looks like the roof from historic pictures has gone through a bunch of different um, roof types. Um, and I think we just wanted maybe some guidance from the Historical Commission, although I don't know that I'm prepared to give it. Maybe you could weigh in a little bit more in addressing that issue, Nate. Yeah, I mean, I think if we were okay with the Jones Library, uh, using synthetic slate, we would be okay with the um, church. I think the church, right, probably it was originally a um, a wooden shingled roof. And then it was over time, um, you know, there's been asphalt, there's probably been a rolled roof, and then there's slate. And so it's probably had a few different roof, um, roofing materials. You know, the CPA committee would say, you know, they're, they, they wonder if CPA money is granted. So the application is to, you know, part of it's, some of the roof is failing. So some of the purlins and the structural members in the roof uh, and the timber framing have failed, there's rot. And so the slate 
Uh, the idea, I don't know if, if for newer members, they had requested funding last year to try to fix the slate. Um, and the CPA committee said, well, we'll hold some money in reserve until there's more information about what's available. And so um, the idea was to um, look at different ways of fixing the roof or parts of it or what material. And so the idea is to um, use asphalt shingles, could be architectural shingles to have some relief uh, and look somewhat stylistically like, you know, slate or some overlapping material individual shingles. What is um what is architectural? What did you call it? Architectural architectural shingles. So yeah, thank you. What yeah, does that you mean? Know, just like you can have a an asphalt shingle that's flat, or then you can have some that are that they're layered, so they just um you know they have a little bit more relief to them, so it looks like they're. I I can Google a picture. Uh, so yeah, I you know it's interesting. I when we were talking about the Jones Library. Or I think it was the Jones Library, you know, someone, may, maybe Jane Wald made the comment that, you know, newer material is lighter, so it's actually easier structurally uh, on, a, on a building because you're not carrying the weight. Um, yeah, that's correct. That's what I heard also. Right. And so, uh, you know, even the local historic district allows the use of uh, asphalt shingles as a substitute um, for different roofing materials. So I feel like it's, it's a, I think it's a, I think it's okay. I think you know, if we were saying, you know, what, you know, would it meet national park standards? You know, is it, is it um, as part of a rehabilitation project? Is it, um, you know, is it compatible? You know, it's a, it is a new material, but like I said, I think the roofing material on the church has undergone changes throughout the history of the building. So, you know, I think it's, I think it's okay. I also think that, um, on the slope of the roof and the visibility of it from um, the street is minimal, actually. So you're, you actually have to be a, a somewhat of a distance away to be able to see the roof. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're actually not on the street in front of it or on Pine Street next to it. You actually have to, you're going to be further back along North Pleasant Street or down on Meadow Street, and you might see it at an angle. So I think given the kind of the low visibility of the roof, I think that, um, you know, I think that's probably okay. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not sure. I think, um, CQ, we were going to have you and other CPA applicants come before the commission on December 4th too, and talk about your proposal a bit more. And then okay. there's still time to get before the CPA committee, before the recommendation. So the commission often will write a memo or something or okay. through Bob and who's the rep just discuss the project. So okay. um, I think you'll have a chance to come back, but. Yeah, and a part of maybe part of what our, our memo can state is, you know, if we just give a, if we can get some basic um, history to, you know, the roof changes over time. I mean, it's all, that it all, it all has to do with, you know, what is essentially the park service is the secretary of interior standards, right? But that just means that we need to document that, historically at one point in time <laughs> had an asphalt roof um, or, you know, or, um, you know, a waiver for, for, um, you know, for consideration of, I mean, this is the tricky part with the, the, the standards is like, you know, you're supposed to do this, but then the park service lets you do, you know, <laughs> um, um, artificial slate, like they'll make an exception. So I think we just have to, um, you know, just very briefly, explain our reasoning from the commission to say, yeah, we, this meets with, um, this meets with the historic um, um, fabric of, of the building at a certain period of time. And then, then that's just kind of like crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Okay, during the process of uh, submitting application, getting estimate, I did contact uh, two company who specialize in slay. And one, I get in touch with them again, uh, he's no longer accepting job. He's planning on retire. Other person who give us estimate on $315,000 oh, yeah. on yep. slay roof yep. says he will not do partial replace yep. slay on our church roof. So we kind of in a uh, binding situation and uh, yeah, no, we just... reason mostly. So. Yep. Would that be yep. good if we could, you know, 
present our case once more to December 4 to commission. That yeah. will be good. And then we I will we could hear wait to hear from their decision, then we could move forward, correct? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Yeah, I think that this is an interesting one. Um, so I think the structure is really important. It does need to be preserved. You know, we've met with um, town staff has met with Seek Young and other representatives from the church a few times over the last year. And um, yeah, I mean, this a slate slate roof is really, it's really interesting. The there are very few craftsmen, you know, craftspersons who will do this work anymore. It's right. very expensive. Yeah. Uh, and then and it probably wasn't actually the original roof to the building, uh, which you know, it's hard to, if you see that now, you say, oh, that slate's been on there since it was built, but it actually probably wasn't. And I think there's some documentation that it wasn't. Um, right. so. Okay. Okay. So um, next meeting we decided was uh, December, Monday, December 4th. Mm -hmm. um, are we starting 6.30 again? Yes. 6.30, yes. Okay. Um, and with that, there are no further comments from commissioners or staff. Uh, we can adjourn the meeting at 8.33. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Robin. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, Thank you, you too. too.